<laughs> Good morning and Merry Christmas, church. Good morning. Good morning. We're not quite the New Year's yet. It's still Christmas, folks. I want to start by telling you a story. Born in 1959, he grew up in Milton, Delaware. Not all that far from here. His mother worked at Dover Air Force Base as a bookkeeper. He attended an AME church where he played piano and sang in the choir. Today he recalls how his views now were influenced by the strong faith of the people in that church where churchgoers were celebrated for standing up after having fallen down. He spent the first few years in segregated schools, officially at first and then unofficially segregated. When he was 13 years old, excuse me, 16 years old, his grandfather was brutally murdered. The person responsible received life sentence life sentences in prison, which seemed to him fair at the time. He went on to go to Harvard Law School and became a lawyer. During this time, he claims that he realized that he wasn't going to be fulfilled, fulfilled in his career, but he kept thinking up good reasons to keep going in his career track anyway. But it was during his time at Harvard Law that he took a class on race and poverty litigation and ended up working for a Stephen Bright Southern Center for Human Rights, which represents death row inmates <coughs> down south. When I heard him speak this summer, he reminded us, when there's a bad part of town, most of us have been told to stay away from there. However, it's only in proximity that we begin to understand what it means to lead. Say proximity, church. Proximity. In his words, there is power in proximity. <clears throat> While working with death row inmates, these people headed for a court-mandated ending to their lives. He started meeting prisoner after prisoner after prisoner. He looked into their eyes and he heard their stories. Since 13 states have no minimum age to be tried as an adult in this country, he met someone whose mother had been, had been hit repeatedly by her boyfriend. The mother's son killed the mother's boyfriend in defense. And since, but since the mother's boyfriend was a deputy sheriff, he was automatically tried as an adult. By the time this person met him, this lawyer found him being badly abused in prison, and he opened up to him. In the mid-1990s, Brian Stevenson, the person I've been talking about, went on to found the Equal Justice Initiative, which works with people on death row. By August of 2016, the Equal Justice Initiative has saved 125 <coughs> men from the death penalty. It has represented poor people, defended people on appeal, and overturned wrongful convictions, particularly of those under 18, and has worked to alleviate biases that may form in our criminal justice system. Stevenson realized some time ago that he represents broken people in a broken system in a world that likes to crush brokenness. When one in three black boys born now are expected to be incarcerated sometime in their lifetime, and six million people are on probation or parole, we know something isn't going right. Amen? <coughs> Effective leadership, he recalls, only happens when you position yourself in uncomfortable places and be willing to be a witness. Change happens when we realize that we are broken too because it's in being broken that we learn to lead. This morning we read about the day of Jesus' dedication. Jewish tradition mandates that a firstborn child should be dedicated to the Lord in thanksgiving to God for having opened the womb of the mom and offering some new life into this family. Often this could mean for that child serving life in the temple. However, a family could, and often did, offer a sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves instead. This is what Mary and Joseph went up to the temple with Jesus to do that day. But when they arrived, there was a prophet named Simeon, whom the Bible notes that the Holy Spirit had rested upon. <coughs> Simeon had been led to the temple area that morning, and when he saw Jesus, Simeon took Jesus in his arms, and he praised God. <coughs> Simeon had been waiting a very long time for that day. Right from the devout, the Bible says, Simeon eagerly anticipated the restoration of Israel. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he'd lived to see the Anointed One of God, the Messiah. That was why when he saw Jesus, all he could do was to praise God in that moment and say, finally, the day has arrived. Finally, what he had been waiting for had taken place, so he prayed. Now, Master, let your servant go in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation. It's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people, Israel. Like two parents who were just told by their child's preschool teacher that your kid is really gifted. Mary and Joseph were amazed, especially after what people had told them when Jesus was born. Simeon went on to tell them that Jesus would grow up to be the source of opposition, especially, and that it would cause a rallying cry that would reveal the hearts of men in Jesus' own lifetime. 
And as if in answer to this revelation, a second prophet by the name of Anna came forward to praise the Lord and to talk about Jesus to, as the Bible says, everyone who had been looking forward to the redemption of Israel. I don't know if they had membership cards that she could identify who they were, but I figure it was everybody that was probably present at the time. Anna, too, was pretty excited. So far, it seems that Jesus' calling has been confirmed by everyone but himself at this point. Young Jesus was the only one who yet had a voice in Scripture. Before the young Jesus could even articulate himself or take care of himself, the Christ's calling appears to have been woven into his personal narrative. Angelic and prophetic announcements, plus poor shepherds proclaiming him to be their savior, all seem to indicate that this child's life will have a profound impact on the people of Israel. Now we today, who know the rest of this story, know just what's going to happen next, right? We know that this child will be a healer and a teacher when he reaches his thirties, that the Messiah would be led to the cross, that would mean the Messiah's death as a result. We also know that suffering and humiliation would not prevent him from fulfilling the prophecies of Simeon and Anna, and he would come back to life and show us a way towards life. But can you imagine what it must have been like to be discovering Jesus' call moment by moment, like Mary and Joseph, to have been there with them, or even to have been there, coming to grips with what angels had told each of them separately, and having their son's calling explained to them by different characters, even strangers in the temple, day by day. We often think of callings as being personal things. I discover my own call, that thing that God has placed upon my life. Perhaps this calling was even preordained before I was born, and like the mythical Hercules, I must go on a heroic quest to discover it for myself. You may need to spend a year eating ketchup in your parents' basement to discover that brand new product you're supposed to sell to the world, or a month in silence in a monastery in the mountains for your divine calling to finally be revealed. These things may well be necessary to discern one's calling or callings, let's hope not the ketchup part. <laughs> But if you haven't discovered what your passion is right now, you are not yet alone. I've answered God's call to pastoral ministry, but I still cringe every time someone makes me wonder what my specific calling might be. What is your specialization, Pastor? Am I focused on biblical teaching, or prison ministry, or pastoral care, fighting for equality for any number of different groups, stopping drug abuse, homelessness, championing, championing community causes, drawing people into a deeper relationship with God through prayer? The list goes on and on and on. Even within my own call, there's a host of passions to choose from. And many people have argued that the reason that we find ourselves so many, without so many passions in this world is that there are too many choices out there for us to pick from. Afraid of living a passionless existence adrift, I tune in closely then to listen to voices that promise to help me figure out what my passion is. But in the prophetic voices of Simeon and Anna, and anyone who has ever had anything prophetic to speak into your life, we hear that the calling may not simply be sitting latent inside you, waiting to be called forth into the world. Everything about our American dream tells us that we and the people we love will be happiest when we acquire more stuff or more success or even pushing the lines forward in progress. Our rugged individualism even raises up as heroes those who have the strength to go it alone. But what if the answer to what is God's calling in my life is actually not your dream, but someone else's? Maybe, just maybe, your calling comes from elsewhere. Perhaps the dream that God has in store for you isn't your dream at all. It's someone else's dream that God has been preparing for you to fulfill as they waited for you to arrive. The other night I left the coalition after the memorial service, and I ran over to the grocery store for a few things, which is right down the street. I did all my shopping and talked back and forth with Jennifer on the phone about the trip we were taking and what did we need and what was everybody else bringing and I finally got all the way up to the counter, put my stuff out there, not that many things really, I've been bigger shopping trips, and finally I chatted with the cashier a bit as she rang up my order and then she mentioned the total. And that's when I reached into my pocket for my wallet to discover that it was not there. I had left it at home. Well, now I was really frazzled because it's terribly embarrassing to get to the end of the grocery line and discover that you don't have the money to pay for the groceries, which are now melting. So I apologized profusely, and I asked her to put my things aside until I could run home then for my wallet. And just as I was running out of the building, hoping that nobody had seen what had just transpired, I heard someone call after me, Hey, where's your hat? <laughs> I have no idea, because I have no hat. 
I'm not wearing a hat today. So I have no idea why this got my attention, but maybe it does absurdity of the question, maybe this turn around, even in the state of mind that I was in, and I discovered an older white gentleman wearing a fine looking hat. No wonder he was asking about his hat. Maybe he wanted me to ask him about his hat. I don't know. But a moment later, he had misheard something that I'd said, and thinking that I said something about a funeral, which would have made perfect sense, except that I didn't say it, and realizing that I was a clergy person, which also would have made perfect sense, except that I hadn't said anything about being a clergy person. He then confessed that he was a Roman Catholic, a lay person, but also a chaplain, and we walked out of the store together. Pretty soon he told me about how the Holy Spirit had been working throughout his life, and when he could see that I was eager to get home and back before my groceries melted in the <laughs> store, he invited me to lay hands on him and to pray then for his healing. Certainly I could have said no, given the length of that my quick trip to go get my wallet was now taken. <laughs> but I then realized that I had been given a calling and I accepted my role in it. I prayed from there in the parking lot and I suspect our paths will cross again. One never knows. I have discovered that I don't know what my, what my passion is. I know who my passion is. It's Jesus and all of God's people. But as far as the what, well, that's been determined for me based on the needs I see around me at the time. All those little appointments where somebody grabs you on the street and suddenly starts to tell you things that the conversation wasn't actually leading towards, but suddenly that's where it is. Well, sometimes it's looking into the eyes of somebody who says, this is a real problem. Where are the Methodists? Or where is God? Where are the Christians? Does anybody care about me? Well, those are appointments too. And those are times when we find out what our passions are because somebody tells us on their lips what God wants us to know, <coughs> what God wants us to do. In fact, what I love most about my work is not knowing what God has in store for me next. Every congregation I'm called to serve has been for a different purpose. For some, it was, for the last one, it was Hurricane Sandy arriving three months after I arrived and a hospital that needed to be preserved. And who knows how many other little smaller appointments happened during that time. Every congregation has a different purpose. Every day then also calls me to serve however God needs me. And some days I wake up and know exactly what my day is going to look like. It's all pre-scheduled for me, even though every hour is a different hour. And other days that entire schedule goes out the window, like I'm sure it does for all of you. Things just change, don't they? Our real heroes tend to have their destinies thrust upon them. They don't go out seeking. So the answer for how to discover the passion that God has carved into your heart isn't to go on a quest then and go find it. Instead, it's to listen to the needs of the people around you, to find a little proximity, as Brian Stevenson has said. After all, we follow in the way of Jesus, who gave up the comfort of heaven to draw close to us, to be our listener, to experience what we've experienced, and to discover what it is that we needed the most. Now, could God have figured that out for God's self? Could God, is God omniscient enough to be able to know what it is that was going on in our lives? Sure, but isn't it different to experience it for yourself? Isn't it drastically different to hear from somebody face to face, to feel them touch or to cry on your shoulder and to know what the real need might be? It's different, isn't it? And it somehow gets to the heart. To our hearts, not theirs. It brings us closer. It helps us to answer a calling. Some of them lifelong. <coughs> I was saying to David earlier, some of these callings are lifelong callings. And some of these callings are just callings in the parking lot while the groceries are melting inside the store. <laughs> God gives us these little callings. These are precious gems. Well, maybe God's passion for us, God's dream for us, is that we just listen to the dreams of others. In Jesus' name.